All right. Yeah, it's recording now. Okay, so let's like, I'm just breaking down the components we have. So let's say we have, this is our hard disk, right? And this is our memory, which is RAM, right? And we have these two hardware components. And now let's say uh, we are going to like serve the read and write request for a user when he wants to store some data. Like if he ha his data is key value pairs just to make everything easy and we have to store those key value pairs and we have to read them and write them right so what we are uh, doing in ss tables is that so first thing like i think me and dippy have discussed this thing in more detail that so every hardware it's good at something and it is not good at something right so the advantage of using ram is so ram as a hardware it is created like this it's a random access memory right so that means if like you have various memory locations on your ram where you can store the data and similarly you have uh, memory locations on your hard disk for ram the hardware is such that like your circuit is kind of connected to every memory location so let's say if you ask RAM that give me data at this memory location, it can, it because it has a direct connection to that memory location, it can give you data in that memory location in big of one time, right? So that's why I think it's also called random access memory that randomly, if you want to get data at any memory location, it is very fast. It takes big of one. Whereas hard disk, it's uh, like a rotating device. So here you would have like some spindle read, read head and then your data, like your memory locations would be on a circular disk. So let's say if I'm asking hard disk that, hey, I want the data at this memory location, right? This is my memory location, please give me data. For hard disk, it has to first rotate and bring its spindle head over here, right? Once the spindle head comes over here, then it can read that data and return it back to you. So, I mean, so basically if you want to randomly access data, it will be like, because of this overhead, like this is one overhead, but still I won't say that hard disks are not random access because you can rotate that rotation is very fast and you can randomly access data. Like there are worse devices like tapes and all. I was talking to like one of the teams which store the data on tape for archival and all. So that magnetic tapes, right? Mm -hmm. So magnetic tapes are even slower that there the tape, the tape has to rotate and that rotational is very slow. So there we can definitely say that it's not random access. The tape has to seek and go to that point and, uh, and then get the data, right? So basically the point is that these hardware devices operate differently and that's why whatever read and write we are trying to do with our data, we want to optimize and make best use of our hardware, right? So now, so this is just a basic background. So now coming back to the key value store, like I will, uh, so, uh, so, so. Um, Abhishek, one, one quick thing, right? Whenever I see that a lot of places, even in the book, like we always talk about HDD. Uh, but if you look at, um, I mean, like more, since it's all distributed systems and all, I, isn't it like most of these things have already moved to SSDs and uh, HDD uh, talking performance or talking anything with respect to HDDs, HDDs is like little uh, not relevant? I, or okay, does right. it also have a similar thing with the system? You're right, like compared to HDDs, right? Spindle, SD, SSD would be faster, but yeah. compared to memory, it will still be slower. Yeah, still be slower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I don't know what, like what's the functioning. Yeah, exactly. So that's the point is, so that's why we have to understand. And, you know, that's why these teams which work closely with hardware, so they work closely that how that hardware operates. I don't know how SSD operate and probably, yeah, SSD might be good at some things. So you would 
probably write your data structures in such a way that you are optimizing the use of SSD. But I feel I still. Also, sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. I just wanted to add one point about just in terms of not just the hardware, right? But the way hardware is laid out. So if you look at architecture, memory is closer to, you know, right. Right. versus yeah. a hard, the durable medium like disks are yeah. farther away, right? It's a yeah, it's a very good point. So let's say we have a CPU, right? And what DP is saying is that so when we want to process something, like memory is closer to CPU. But when if we want to get something from hard disk, we have to like first perform I/O. So this is I/O bandwidth from I/O. First the data will go in memory and then it will go to CPU. And I have missed a lot of layers. Like there would be some caching layer over here. So yeah. now you see that overall RAM is anyways faster if you have anything in RAM because it, it has that direct connection from CPU. Whereas if you want to get something from hard disk, you need to perform that I/O, get that in memory, and then you can process it, right? Is that right? Is that yeah. what is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's right. That's a good point, actually. Yep. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now th this is yeah. So sorry, I, I was I took some time. So this is just the basic. Okay. Now let's okay. go into uh, SS table. So 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 the point is that hash maps, right? So hash maps, you want to big off one access some memory location. So hash map, we can also store in disk. It's not that we cannot store in disk, but the point is in RAM, they're really fast because you can go to that memory location in hash map. You randomly hash to a memory location and you are asking for that data. So they're really fast in RAM. So in this book, they're trying to say that we should uh, consider storing hash maps in RAM, right? And now, like this, this thing also for SS table, what we are trying to do is that in memory, we will create a sorted tree. What is those AVL trees and red black trees, right? So this data structure will be created in RAM because, because it would be fast to sort things and all. If we are doing the sorting and all in hard disk, it will take time. So how the algorithm works is when a new data comes, key value pair comes, it will uh, it will create this AVL tree. It will add the data to this AVL tree, right? And so now, okay, let's say when a write request comes, what will happen? What all operations will happen? First, it will uh, it will uh, add this thing to this existing AVL tree, right? This AVL tree, wherever we have that sorted data. Then in hard disk, it will also maintain a... Uh, uh, kind of an append only log, right? And why we are maintaining append only log? Because up till now, this data is stored in memory. If I, my system crash or if my system restarts, I can get back, I should be able to get back this AVLT, right? So mm -hmm. this append only log only has the data for whatever AVLT I have in memory. Once my AVL tree becomes bigger than a particular size. So now it's a sorted thing. So I have a set of files, which is I think SS files or whatever, right? I have a set of files. So whatever latest file I have, I will write this data in this file. So let's say D1, which has these records and I will flush it back. I will, I will flush all this data and now my RAM is empty and now I can store more writes, right? And my D1 is staying here, data one is staying here. Then when the new writes come again, I will create this uh, AVL tree. I will keep on creating this AVL tree. And also, yeah, so sorry. So this will also be flushed and this append only log will also be flushed because now I have the data in disk. So I'm not afraid that if my system restarts, I will lose it. So now we have everything. So now we have this, right? Similarly, when we get new data, this D2 is created, right? So like this data is created. What will happen is after a time, this file will become full and we will say now my, this file has become full. Now start creating another file. So this is F1, this is F2 and this is F3, right? So now I have these multiple files. So right now my right head is pointing to F3 that whenever your AVL tree will become full, you, you have to write it to F3 because uh, F3 has the space. These files I have closed. They have 
become full right so one thing is these files have my data in the sorted order but they they like my data would be repeating because let's say if a key value pair comes let's say my key was 5 and value was 15 so uh what i was doing is uh, what i was doing was i was adding this to the avl tree and once avl tree becomes full i will write this 515 on the file when the avl tree is put back here so if while i was in the avl tree while this value was in avl tree if i say now that f- the value of 5 should be 10 probably i will update it within the avl tree and i will make it that the value of 5 should be 10 right but once this data is written to the disk then i am not whenever i get a write request i won't again look at the disk so now again if the 5 comes and if the value is 7 i will create another avl tree and i will write the value of 5 as 7 so like in this file i might have the value of 5 as uh, key 5 as 10 and in this file the value would be 7 so my latest value is this 5 7 right and so now i can see that also my files would have this duplicate data that for 5 i have 10 for 5 i have 7 and i only need the latest value right 10 is no longer useful for me so now th- there is this process of c- compaction what will happen in c- compaction is that so now my write is happening on this file my these two files are full so what i will do is i will create a background thread that background thread is reading the data from these two files it is not writing anything so we don't need any locks or something in the meanwhile if someone wants to access the value of 5 which is 7 they can definitely access it because i am just reading so my background process is reading it is compacting because these files are sorted my co- compaction process will be faster so it will compact and it will pick the latest value of 5 as 7 and similarly all all whatever uh the latest value it can pick it will pick it will compact once my this file is totally prepared like I, i know that this file has all the data it will say now whatever reads were going to these files switch the reads to this file atomically so there will be no there should not be any lag you just have to point your read head like whatever memory location was to these now you can say that you can get this data from these files so now whatever was the combined data i have here so now i can remove these files so now i have compacted my data this is the file and my writes were being continued over here so this is one part then another part is hash map yeah. first i want to know that is this part clear to everyone or was it yeah, i just clear? want to make one thing clear maybe I, it was just me who got lost because initially i thought we are talking about hashing and you know why we are not maintaining hash tables on disk and that's where i thought we had a context about random access and all that going on uh, but just to you know since we are recording this i think it would be good if we you know just reiterate or the high level question we were trying to address yeah yeah okay yeah yeah you're right i i didn't talk about hash map and i started i have a i have a, a question about this one okay if i would move the hashing so that table i mean that file the file that uh, the coin to it keep growing right because as you have new uh, new data you keep writing and merging and compacting to this single file Right? yeah no. okay so Sorry. when we keep grinding and would it happen that you know we have to uh when we merge we have to uh write to the in the middle of the file right that would cost a lot right no so see like just going over here so we are not writing in the middle so we had these let's say we had two files and these files were complete and so the assumption is we always write to one file there is only one write thread and whichever file has so one file will have empty buffer and we will always write to that file so this file is full that's not what i mean i mean like when we compact you know the data right so when you we already have a big file let think about the the file point to we we have that file for many month right and right. now you know we need to compact it to that big file Right. Then we we have to uh, 
chain the value or, or you know merge and chain the value over there right right and that file you know it it it, it, it huge so is there uh you know performance impact you know if we write in the middle because someone was talking about you know uh this uh defragmentation something on the chat you know because we we may not have enough space right so why yeah if if you are facing this problem why do you want to keep the size of file huge you can say that whenever my file becomes more than 5 mb i will i will just close this file and i will create a new file so now you have smaller files to compact and now you can compact the smaller files like why would we create huge files which are difficult to there compact? is another point there right uh, one is creating smaller files and even if there is let's say i think at one point there was a discussion about fragmentation right uh, yes. i think that's where they talk about also introducing the concept of merging right for example you run compaction and you create this file which is let's say 70% full right and now when you start compaction again maybe you start a new segment file and that is only 30% full so i think one of the concepts that's talked about in the book is that you can in the background also run merging so that you can you know maybe merge these two compacted segments i mean just as an example there are a lot of uh, concerns that go there about yeah. how you're going to run merging because i believe segments get closed and all of that but uh, i think there was uh, the concept of merging which was associated with this you know right okay so, yeah probably when we merge these files we don't know that what will be the yeah. final output size right it could this file could be big or it could be small yeah that yeah so so actually the they use the two two strategy to merge these two files uh, merge these file one is that based on the size and another is actually based on the level whether the data is very old or not so it's not uh, explained in a detail it's a very small section explained on page 79 yeah yeah right it talks about level tiered and size tiered yeah i yeah, yeah. i could not get that yeah because it, they just mentioned the level yeah. Yeah, I so think my my question is at the end. Let's see, at the end, you have only one single big file, right? Let's see, you know, at the end, there's nobody uh, doing it right, right? Because no, you, you no, merge no. them. Is that gonna be a single big file? Uh, you I don't know? think so? I mean, uh, there will be a single big file. So that's what I'm uh, saying. That if you will read that on page seventy nine, so they mentioned that the strategy. So even though you can you can define the size for a single yeah. file, yeah. It's it's not always a, just a single file, the final output. So if let's say you don't have a single file, you know, suppose you have multiple files, mm -hmm. then you know how do you know uh, what file to search? So, so that for, for that uh, you have to keep that uh, uh, hash table, uh, which will actually have the the the. key and yeah. the and the starting starting key key uh, which belongs to that particular se uh, segment yeah but it also another we have thing. the same uh, could could potentially potentially have the same uh, similar tree right different value but they have the same tree is it i mean the same avl tree on uh, one we don't know the value what it is so no. how to know the range so then we have Bio. AV, AVL tree, the purpose for the AVL tree to keep the data sorted, but at the same time they keep the the sparse in sparse index in memory to search the data on disk. Yeah, I you know I read that I understand, but that's per file, right? That for is, single file, one. but you have multiple yeah. files. You need to so, go so, each file and search for it. So, so we, we yeah within that file you have to do the sequential search. Yeah. yeah but okay, i think leon is making leon is talking about one other thing uh, i think what you are saying leon is you have multiple files now how you are going to search across so i think i don't know who was talking before within a single file with a sparse index yes you can do a sequential search um, but if you have multiple files i think there is a mention in the book which says uh, there are multiple uh, hash tables which are maintained for each segment file so now when you want to search for something 
you look for the hash table which refers to your latest segment. So you go backwards because you want the most recent value, right, for a data point. So that's how you go backwards. You start from hash table of the most recent segment file. And then if you don't find it there, then, I mean, there is a lot of complexity with sparse index. But this is one thing I noted that they are saying you will maintain different hash tables for different files. Should we go to like, let's quickly go to like how we will build hash table and then let's see what are the problems, right? So uh, the thing uh, what has happened up till now is that once my data does not exist in AVL tree, once I have written it to the disk, now it lives in disk. So if I have to search for that data, let's say I don't have hash map, right? What would I would have to do is because my files, they were created based on the latest timestamp. So first I will go to the most latest file in the latest file. If I will search whether the key exists or not, it will be sorted. If the key exists, I will return the value. If the key does not exist, I will go to one file back, which was created before this, then this file, and I will search and I will return the data, right? So now my reads for reads, I have to search. I don't know where the memory location of that key exists. So what I can do is to make this process faster, I can create the in-memory hash table, what we have discussed, right? So what will happen with in-memory hash table is, uh, and I'm not exactly sure that this in-memory hash table is created when the right request comes. At that time, it is updated or it is created later once a full file is completed. But so what happens is for a particular key, you are saying that at what particular location you can look and get the data, right? You have that address of that location. This is your hash map. Uh, this is the data in your hash map. But the problem we had with the previous hash maps is if there are so many keys, there is only so, so much data you can store in memory. So your hash map will become full. Here the advantage is because your data is sorted, you don't need to keep every key in the hash table. You can create like some range. So let's say because the data is sorted one, two, three, four, like this, your keys are sorted. So you will say that for one to five, I will just store the memory location of first address, right? Whatever is the address. Now, if I want to get the key, uh, if I want to get the value for three, uh, I will search for the nearest key, which is one. I will go to that address and I will get the value here that the value is three, right? But now the problem, the problem is that we are so sorting in this way. So for one, we have data. Let's say we don't have data for two. We have data for three. We have data for four, right? Now, if my key comes as two and I know the nearest key is one. So I, I don't know whether this two exists in the hash map uh, in actually on the disk or not. So I will go here. I will see that the two does not exist. And so now I will like, I would have to go to disk and actually find out that two does not exist. But then I don't know. They say that you have to go to all the files to actually find out whether. Yeah. I, I don't know if this index maintains all the keys, right? Because what we have is uh, yeah, yeah. only range so for one to five so we will I mean, have uh, even the ranges right because the the keys could exist in different files do we also need do we also need to maintain the segments oh right so yeah that is address right each location is uniquely identified by address oh you respect segment files yeah i think yeah, yeah. across files also because that's the memory location address which will be unique so yeah. whenever you are writing a segment so you only write it for the particular time period itself whenever i mean uh, so that uh, avl tree or the something that you are talking about it only gets accumulated till uh, a particular size limit itself after that it gets written to the disk um, right. so uh, first it checks that in memory avl tree and if it is there it is the most recent one but yeah. uh, if it is not there you actually check uh, 
uh, the files, but every file uh, you have uh, both the bloom filter thing and uh, a summary file that actually uh, what you are mentioning is just parse index. So for every file you maintain the bloom filter and uh, a sparse index. That is actually the sparse. I mean, if the bloom filter gives it as a positive, so that key can exist. Uh, so then at that time you load that uh, sparse index into memory and you bind the search on that uh, uh, thing and you find the uh, in which keys it is like it is trying to lie and you uh, so in that sparse index you will actually store uh, the length I mean the index at uh, which the value is starting at so uh, so you have the keys in key range in which this uh, uh, requested key is lying at so then you go to the particular part you try to read that particular file and you try to uh, read that particular value if it is existing right. sometimes it may happen that uh, um, you found that surrounding keys but uh, that the key may not exist in even the file and yeah when and uh, so you guys have mentioned that uh, the compaction strategies right so uh, you uh, need okay. to understand can into yes. compaction can i have can i ask one question here so no no, no one minute yeah. just let me complete it yeah. so you, you need to understand the compaction strategies to know how many files uh, uh, that uh, that it has to read before returning a key value so sometimes it may happen that you just updated a column itself for other columns you might have to read other uh, files as well yeah mm -hmm. yeah so yeah like so th that was good actually i'm still confused about like bloom filters is also like uh, uh, if you put bloom filters aside which helps us in uh, making sure we don't search for the non-existing uh, keys so this parse this parse uh, index that we are maintaining right would it contain uh, all the segments locations or would it actually contain the memory location directly where we don't have to care about the segment files because the way initially was like you search in the mem memcache uh, and if it doesn't exist, which is AVL tree, if it doesn't exist, you go to the latest segment and start searching from the end. That was the start of it, right? Start searching from the end and keep going until you finish the latest segment and then go to the next latest segment and try to find the key. Right here, how is the sparse index maintained? Yeah, the, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I don't know because so one thing I don't understand is so we have multiple files and each file is sorted within itself but among themselves they are not sorted right yeah yeah so yeah. now this one key so let's say my one to five range one two could exist here and then in one to five range probably one three and four exist here right among these files right. so now if i'm searching for so first i don't know that what address we are storing are we storing the address for the latest file or... i believe we are storing the address for the latest file uh, and this can be implemented different ways right my yeah. understanding is when we have this uh, sparse index if if we store it this way right uh, let's say we only have first file in the beginning and we have these values one to five mm. and then all of them are and let's say we have sparse index for you know we can do uh, one example is we can do it value based, right? So if I have a sparse index, I can point them to first file. Now, when I write the second one, which is belonging to another file, I if I have that key in my sparse index, I can update the pointer to point to the latest file. Right. Um, okay. And so on. That is one way. But if but the other way is we can also maintain uh, let's say sparse index by the segments i'm thinking like the first block right since the values are sorted so mm -hmm. obtain a pointer to you know by on the segment basis then i'm saying like pointer to first segment second segment I mean, that's what the was the strategy mentioned in the book for this sparse index i, I don't know I if i followed that actually not very detailed 
and i think now this is what happens if you're searching for two if your your sparse address points here and now you will see that the two does not exist so you would have to go back to other files yeah. and see whether yeah. two exist or not correct correct that's true so this sparse index that uh, that was referred here has a memory of the latest segment or does it have yeah. like the starting index of the latest segment starting so as far as i know uh, actually the sparse index is maintained for every segment so every whenever segment. you write the file to the disk you write that index uh, index i mean the sparse index to the memory as well that is how you read it to memory and you search it in the file uh, but the thing is the sparse index can become huge when you have a, a lot more keys so that is why for every uh, i mean there are uh, various strategies so it it can be like uh, every 16 mb you write one key or something like uh, uh, for every 100 keys you write one key something yeah. like that as well yeah. both are possible yeah oh so yeah oh. so every every segment has a sparse index which is maintaining the the range of keys the segment holds so yeah, yeah. that can be one idea right yeah so yeah i mean yeah yeah so good so then so then we have hash index for this we have hash index for this when the key uh, comes first i will search in this latest hash index yeah. i will get the address if it does not exist here then i will go to this hash index i will see where is the memory location for one and search for it yeah this could also be one approach yeah yep i think that makes sense okay mm. okay so yeah mm. in one of the statements in the book just before the picture like there were two bullet points and in one of the bullet points at the end it exactly like talks about one scenario i think what abhishek mentioned uh, that makes sense but there is another one where it says when multiple segments contain the same key we can keep the value from the most recent segments and discard the values in order uh, yeah yeah uh, the the, uh, the only thing i'm afraid about this approach is that so we were creating the sparse index because we were saying that our in memory space is yeah, less yeah. and now if we are creating for each file we are creating a hash index then yeah. i think we are running into that problem so that's why probably this could also happen that we you have the hash index for whatever latest data you have seen for that key range so for that key range there is some data which is latest but it might not have everything so now right. if i'm searching for two i might get two here i might not if i don't get here then i go have to go back yeah. all the way to see if the two exists or not kind of a trade off right we are trying to save memory space with sparse index but at some point we have to offset the cost yeah exactly <laughs> and uh, there is a and this sparse index also have to be updated on every compaction yes yes every compaction uh, the index is also updated all no right because we are saying that hash index is ha hash index has the latest memory reference to that starting range right so and anyways when we are doing the compaction we are doing deleting the old records so it should be fine right why oh yeah yeah it's not updated but it's the index yeah i mean eventually the previous index, new sparse index is created yeah okay okay yeah okay In yeah the, i mean yeah the detailed implementations can be many which is yeah which is good that we are discussing that so okay 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 and i think he also mentioned about a write ahead log that is maintained for uh, for the avl tree alone right not for the sparse index yeah so write ahead log was this right which we discussed that while the things are in memory mm -hmm. our system can crash so we will create this append only log mm -hmm. once this is flushed and returned to the file then we can also flush this append only log and then we will create new append only log for the new tree which is created in memory oh. uh what if we lose the sparse index because it's also maintained in memory right yeah so in memory we will have two things avl tree and the sparse index 
so i think you should also yeah so it. one thing is uh, like uh, if you lose the in memory data structure uh, some of the approaches are you can you know if you are maintaining snapshots of your in memory structure at periodic times that can help in recovery because when the system comes back up you can read the snapshot and try to recreate your index so that's what the append only log is right so basically this tree tree is a in memory data structure yeah. why because you are pointing to memory locations within your memory right this this is the memory location where this data exists so this cannot be as it is stored on hard disk because for hard disk memory locations are different it will take some time so that's why you are just creating a simple append only log and now if your system crashes then from append this append only log first you have to recover and create your in memory tree so it will like you will spend some time creating this tree and then now you will start taking the request so i mean uh, it yeah so you would have to take but because it would wouldn't happen so frequently but if it happens at least you are not losing the data but you would have to spend some time to create this tree again okay for sparse index probably we can build it from the segments right so that yeah. may not be yeah. needed sparse index we can yeah. create or or for sparse index yeah we can also create some copy and then we can snapshot recover that, uh, yeah. that you was mentioning yeah like snapshot yeah okay awesome awesome good uh, thanks from abhishek yeah it was good discussion yeah A any other questions guys i think we just have like 5 minutes more i have a question can you guys hear me yep yeah so uh, so uh, uh, can you scroll down to the uh, example where uh, you were not able to uh, find a key in the latest uh, segment right so you go back and you you look into the hash index of the old segment so how are this two hash indexes connected like how does the new hash index uh you know how, how is that process being done like a key that is not in the uh, latest segment uh then you start searching in the old segment but but you i just want to see clarity on you know how does that process or that switch happen within like it's going to go to the segment but it needs to kind of look at to look into the hash index of the old segment to figure out uh, you know the range and then look into it and if that is also not there it goes to the previous yeah. segment so yeah, I, I mean, sorry go ahead abhishek no you yeah i mean i was saying that i i am not really clear on this that if we have multiple hash index for each file but if we have that then whatever approach you are saying it seems right to me that first you will take the latest hash index find the key uh, for that key range you will find the data if you don't then you will go to previous hash index yeah. but if you are just maintaining one hash index then the approach would be little different and i don't know how they are doing it I, like my assumption is we have just one hash index because then again we are storing so much data in memory so whatever point we were trying to save with the sparse index we are not actually using that advantage but i am not sure so remember what uh, uday mentioned right he mentioned that at each file you know there will be a bloom filter right yeah. so you know if you go to that you look at the bloom filter first to say okay does this key exist in this file if it not then go to the next file you don't even need to look at the parse you know uh, index in there and you know if it happened to be in that file then you go search for that file use the parse index yeah so oh, this is a bloom filter per parse yeah there's a bloom filter idea right because if we are if we think about this approach whether we have one sparse index or multiple the regardless of that what you are doing is you are looking for the key in sparse index uh, whether you find it or not you find the closest one but then you are hitting the disk and trying to search it there and yeah. if it doesn't exist it's an unnecessary cost you are paying right yeah. so to save that you have this idea of bloom filter where when you look for a key uh, when you are actually creating this sparse index and writing values to disk at the same time you are having this you know bloom filter type structure 
and then when the user comes in and wants to search for a key then rather than hitting now of course if you find the key in hash index it's a straightforward thing but if you don't find it because it's a sparse index then rather than hitting the disk and doing the search you will use your bloom filter structure to you know eliminate if it doesn't exist then you yeah. save the cost and i mean that's where i think it comes into picture yeah i mean because you have to go back and look at all the files yeah. and make yeah. sure that that key does not exist which yeah. can take which can know. take unnecessary yeah I also have a question here. I mean, uh, um, sorry if I didn't understand you correctly. Um, what I hear a lot is like up and only log, right? So the up uh, that's only applicable for inserts, or uh, what about the updates to existing keys? That will happen the in place, or that will happen that will act as up and only. Uh, so up and only log is to save our in memory data structures here. So that will so for. update also in append only yeah. log you will say that for this key the value is now uh, 15 so before you will say that 5 has value 15 now you will say 5 has value 20 right and so append only means you are not ever modifying in place you are just keep on appending now let's say when your system crashes and you have to rebuild this avl tree so you, from append only log looking at the latest you can say that the 520 is the latest value so ignore the previous values and now you will create the avl tree based on this data and the append, append only log is for uh, for all all the operation insert update delete yeah yeah okay and append append only logs are only in memory or they will go to the disk that disk. is on the disk they are only on the disk actually okay got it So I do have a quick question on that. So at what point of time uh, this sparse index um, get updated? At the time of when we actually flush that mem table to the disk, or at the time of compaction, or at the time oh. of insertion in the avl tree? Yeah, I don't yeah, know because that this sparse index is maintained only for those uh, segments, right? So it only gets created when the segment is created. So that so happens my, when no, you're. No, no, my, my my question is that so when we write flush the mem table to the disk. Yep. So that creates that that is actually a SS table right on the disk right when yep. we flush that. Yep. And another operation is that uh, which actually happens in the background when actually system uh, uh, compact these SS tables and create a new one right. Exactly. So at this what word, point of time this uh, this sparse tree get updated? The sparse index, I mean. Uh, yeah. Not updated, right? It gets created every time you create a segment. It gets created. So whenever you create, whenever you flush into the memory, and the sparse index is also created. Right? Depends on you the mean, approach. Uh, right? we, are, we were discussing two approach. Probably we have just one hash index, or other approaches that. For each file, you have different I hash. I think index. one hash index might not work well. I, But I, then, I then go by the approach. What do they saying? Then It, don't you think then that the size of hash index is increasing again? And so the number so of for, uh, like if each key okay. exists multiple times, then you are duplicating the hash index and. Yeah, you might. Also, so one idea. There is already. So, so that sparse index is created only when first time we actually write the SS table, and after that it will be updated only, right? No, it I will be recreated, and the old one goes away. Whenever you come back, you create a new segment, right? And the old segment is okay. deleted. So same way, uh, the sparse index also is the old ones are deleted, and the new one is created because there's a one-to-one -one mapping. One more That's thing: the, the the sparse index stays only on disk itself. When you are searching for a, in a particular file only, it is read to memory. I mean, mm -hmm. in memory data doesn't need any sparse index as it is already sorted. I um, mean, and it is in the RAM. You can already give it in log n or whatever the structure that is in memory structure it is. So the sparse index actually resides in the disk itself. No, so no, you no, don't no. have any too much memory. That's what we discussed, right? So then, why did we 
create sparse index in first place if you have if you are saying that you can store in no, it's days. clearly like mentioned in right like sparse index we are maintaining in memory because we want to save the space no no, no. one one minute one minute let, let me explain so whenever you are trying whenever the bloom filter has given a pass saying that the key might exist in this file you mm -hmm. actually try to read that sparse index file you load mm -hmm. it into that memory and you do a binary search on that data and try to find uh, what locations uh, i mean what uh, file offsets the key can reside in and so, you try to read that uh, uh, starting offset to ending offset Bet in between these ranges you try to search for that key okay so now i'm getting confused that earlier uh, um, i think someone mentioned that i mean that that bloom filter is per ss table but now you are saying that the bloom filter is for all the keys one bloom filter for all the keys right no 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 for every table itself i mean that it just says whether that key exists in that particular ss table file ss table file or not so so to reach up to that ss table file we need to actually take the help from sparse index because the sparse index point uh, point to the particular ss table which means that we have to access the sparse index before using the bloom filter uh, from what uday mentioned uh, that's what i read about uh, the edge base like the same way whenever it has to search for something it doesn't know which ss table files to look for it uses bloom filters and wherever he it gets conf confidently no it doesn't open that rest all it just opens into the memory like all those uh, sparse indexes are read into the memory and then it decides which file to go and check it so bloom filter just tell us that whether the record exists yeah. or not it does not actually point that way in which ss table no it it yeah it, i mean you can get a it, it the bloom filter definitely tells you okay don't look at this file and no, no, wherever no, let me uh, praveen so when you are uh, uh, writing that uh, mem table to the disk you actually uh, feed this key into that uh, bloom filter hash functions and you persist that bloom filter data as well into the disk yeah so, so my, my, that is my, actually read back yeah my, my question is that the bloom filter is for all the keys not for that particular ss table for all the keys for my data um, whatever data i do have yeah. i think yes uh, otherwise so the problem you are trying to solve is that you don't have to go across multiple files if everything like bloom filter is also for every file if hash table is also for every file then again you are you have not solved the problem right you have to go to multiple bloom filters you have to go to multiple hash right table. so so which means that first we check that whether that data exists or not if that exists then we take the help from the sparse sparse index which ss table has that yeah. correct right and if it is not in that hash index then yeah then we it should be no, no it should be it should have, be because yeah. bloom yeah. filter yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it, it may it may not be because on in memory a small right The bloom filter for each file should be small. I think it's safe per file, but we can load it to a memory. How do That's you know? Like, like there, there could be lot of keys, and there could be like lot of files, right? So um, I don't think the bloom filter that it, it save the key. It, it just like an integer and the bit you say you know if it uh, if it on or off it not saving the whole key if it saving the whole key then it will defeat the purpose and the same way i mean why it should be per file i mean bloom the it, it's not that big so for even for the whole database but maybe can that would I make share sense uh, per file because can that I... file know where it is right whether it possible to exist in that file or not now you save it in you know somewhere else then you know everything so changes so bloom filter bloom filter is not about the location bloom filter is whether the data exists or not right so if you have in your uh, whatever in your structure 
if you have values one, two, and five, then boom filter, um, I, I added a snapshot in the channel. So it will actually have a, you know, bitmap, which tells you that, okay, one exists, two exists, five exists. Now, if three comes in, then it will tell you, the structure right there will tell you that three does not exist. So you don't have to use your sparse index. And it has nothing to do with where it exists, which is the stable it exists. That's not the point of Bloom filter, right? So maybe can I share uh, a screenshot from uh, the Cassandra or HBase? Sure, yeah, go ahead. And uh, one question I have is like uh, the Bloom filter, uh, is any key can be there or it is uh, uh, when it when a particular key goes to a file or it goes to a bloom filter is it the partition tables or uh, any key can go into any segment or any file mm. uh, that, that's that's the kind of discussion i think that we are going through probably it's a good topic for next session i think yeah i can take it up and uh, try to explain it in the next session like what uh, if, uh, the filters, but let's see what Uday has. Yeah. Yeah. So these are some of that. Uh, so six is, I mean, I mean, this is a snapshot. I mean, this, uh, so basically uh, this SS table, when it is written, these are some of the files that are written uh, in memory. So these are uh, for a particular uh, uh, SS table, when a particular SS table is written to, uh, in the disk, these are the files that are returned to the disk. So okay. if you see segment? that, uh, what? Are these the segments or? Yeah, each segment is written as multi, I mean, uh, uh, so this data is that one uh, which contains that uh, SS table data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the summary is about, uh, I was telling about uh, the sparse index and the filter is nothing but the bloom filter. Mm -hmm. And this is that uh, sorted by key value. So each one, uh, each SS table, when it is written to disk, you actually emit all these. Okay. So there's a bloom filter per, seg per segment, right? And this is- Yeah, these are, segment. these are disk, these, these reside on disk itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever you are trying to check for a particular file itself, they are loaded into uh, they are loaded into RAM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if if I interpret correctly what you explained, Uday, that, that I mean, you mentioned that the summary file is a sparse index, which means that each SS table has its own sparse index, and the book yeah. says something different. Uh, I don't uh, think they mentioned it very clearly. I mean, they just briefly yeah. talked about sparse index. I was searching for it in the book. Which yes, that, that confusion is getting. I was also looking for it. Okay, guys, I think today that was a good good thing yeah. that it showed us because uh, because we haven't I haven't really seen that thing. I was assuming like these are all like in one single file or so. That was very good thing. Um, uh, I I was thinking like we can jump to the beatrice next session. Uh, but maybe we can quickly. No, so I think one thing we can suggest, we can discuss this offline, but maybe if we have continued topics from last time, depending on the page, do you think we should have a sort of a recitation session rather than, you know, uh, I mean, it depends on how everyone wants to do it. If you're okay with, you know, revisiting or clarifying, clarification is very good because that's where we are really learning. We yeah. don't want to, you know, uh, skip that. But should we have like another evening, you know, session to cover up anything that was not clear last time so that we can move ahead or should we continue during these sessions? So maybe we can discuss this. Yeah, let's discuss in the book club. I think, uh, yeah, I think next session is up and yeah. Abhishek is going to. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to. Okay. Give All right. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, guys. Okay. Yeah.